This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. There are some terrible cases that do exist out there where people were released on bond and then they lost before the Court of Criminal Appeals and they had to walk those people back into prison. And that is a scenario I do not even like to contemplate. But until the court grants him relief, exonerates him, that is a scenario. Well, we got episode four of Outcry. We're going to recap tonight on Distant Replay Podcast. And there's not a lot to get into. It's a very, I mean, compared to the rest of the documentary, it's a little bit of an uneventful episode, but it kind of sets us up for that finale, which is what we're really getting to. But there are some very interesting parts to this episode that we're going to get into tonight. The juror, the city council reviewing the police force. Also, Cody Mitchell, Texas Ranger. We'll get into him. And then also, we'll wrap it all up with what Greg's been doing, then heading in the setup, the tease for this final episode. So welcome into this ready play podcast. I'm Ben George. He's Mike Noto. Mike, not a ton here, but uh, some, I think some few pieces that we need to really need to talk about tonight. Yeah. Th- these docu-series, you know, the more you watch them, sometimes you may look at back at it and be like, man, maybe this was an episode too long, but oftentimes these episodes that seem like they don't have a lot of like new or very relevant information in it. Typically it all gets tied in, in the finale. So I'm thinking that's where we're headed here, but but there's inf- a lot of background info in this episode. Not many, uh, not many bombshells, so to speak. Yeah, not many bombshells at all. It may- mainly focuses on the time spent between Greg getting out on bond and him awaiting that decision from the court of appeals. So let's start at the beginning. The juror. This is where they began the episode with kind of looking back at the the case, and it's really kind of a a look at what everybody's doing as time passes, kind of reflecting on the case while they wait for the decision and. The juror is part of this, and he, he he's one of the guys, and he might have been the last holdout, I think, from the way the conversation sounded. He was the last holdout that thought Greg was innocent when it got to 11 to 1, and he said he ultimately you know, sw- switched his vote to, to really uh, appease everybody in the room with him, all the other jurors, because they were pressuring him. And again, we, we talked about this a little bit, like how quickly, why, why do you change your mind so quickly when we find out you know, the pressure's there, and this guy kind of, he lives with this regret. He get, gets emotional during this conversation as he's telling the story. And again, it just tells you how you know, we don't always take these these roles seriously, but how important it is for the jurors to do their job. And how can you hold them accountable, you know, after the fact? Yeah. And, and you know, this juror, that was a very eye opening way to open the episode. And, you know, he blatantly says he thinks the jury got it wrong. First of all, like you said, he said he starts crying and he has regrets for giving in. But what they didn't really discuss with him is how if you remember initially in the first episode, they went from six, six to eleven one. Right. That I have more of a problem with that. I mean, I have a problem with this guy giving in if he really felt that strongly. Basically, by him giving in, he basically paved the way to Greg serving 25 years in prison. Yep. <laughs> uh, essentially, I'm not putting it all on this guy, but you know, if he didn't give in, we'd be in a different spot. That's just a fact. But I'm more interested in hearing how they got from 6-6 six, six to 11-1. I mean, we'll never hear that because you're not going to get all the jurors to agree to an interview, obviously. But especially when the stakes are so high with these criminal cases, especially with the, with the aggressive charges that, that he was facing, it's really, really infuriating, and uh, it's it's crazy to actually hear it from the jurors a juror's mouth because you typically don't get that perspective. Right, right, and yeah, I think this is just one piece of this episode, kind of being about really making us feel that Greg's innocent. I think this is what this this episode really does is kind of drive home that feeling to the uh, the viewer. Right, I mean, this is the first part of it. We're going to get it throughout this episode, but I think each piece of this tonight on this episode is really setting you up to believe that he's innocent. You know, the more I think about it, and I don't know where that's headed, Mike, but I just kind of a thought as we, we kind of break down this episode. Yeah. Last episode was more swayed towards putting a little seed of doubt in your mind. Yeah. Like, I don't know who did it, but this episode, like you're saying, if you believe Greg didn't do it, uh, it sort of fortified your thinking. So it's Greg's out at this point, as we saw him, he got released on bond at the end of last episode. He's out uh, waiting the decision from the writ hearing. And then also, uh, beyond that. But when he's out, one of the first things he does, Mike, is goes to the city council and uh, speaks to them about the police force and how he wants to see a review on Mannix and Daly and the entire operation by the city because of the way he was treated. I mean, I, nothing came of this. 
as you can imagine, they did a review, a few recommendations. Hey, just take care of these things. Okay, great. Thanks for doing your job. I'm sure the police department will take care of it. And they kind of brush their hands of it and move on. Yeah. And first of all, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but they showed Greg the one of the first scenes that how sick the lake house he was, was yeah. he was staying at. Did you see how sick that house was? Yeah. It, dude, that was, I don't know if they're a dime a dozen in Texas, but uh, it, it's, uh, <laughs> that was a nice freaking house, man. Um, but anyway, so he goes to this city, the city council hearing literally two days after he gets out. And it's basically him speaking to the town council on essentially the police department accountability in his case and specifically points out the incompetence of Chris Daly, the detective, and the chief, uh, Sean Mannix. Now, the only thing I was wondering with this, is, is this something he should be really doing when he's only out on bond and not exonerated yet? I, I, I found it strange that he was doing this. You know, he's out on bond. You know, we'll later find out, as we'll get to in a second, that the judge actually found him to be com like total innocence um, once she had all the information, even on top of granting him bond. But I, I don't think I'd ever seen this before where like, you know, when someone's not fully exonerated, going there and basically calling for Mannix and Daly's job. Yeah. I mean, I, I, no, I see where you're coming from. I guess to me, my, I didn't really think about that. And maybe if he's not, if he ends up going back to prison, he's not exonerated, then yeah, maybe it doesn't look good. But I think he has, I think in the moment he already has the feeling he's fresh off that, that writ hearing, right? He's heard everything that's, that's happened in this case, the lack of investigating that Daly's done, how Mannix has backed him up. And yeah, you know, I'm sure he feels he's very hot in the moment. Right. I mean, he's yeah. Very yeah. And I, I completely get why he wanted to get that stuff off his chest. And he did it in a very calm way, I think, given the situation. Yeah. And, you know, then right after Greg says his piece about what he feels should happen to Mannix and Daly, you know, they announced this review of the Cedar Park Police Department, like you mentioned. And then you have Mannix basically saying to the interviewer of the documentary, like, hey, I don't really care about what people think of me, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, you know, if I was him, honestly, he, I mean, he probably knew how this review was going to play out. Oh, yeah. It was going to be reviewed just to appease, appease people. It wasn't really going to find anything concrete. They went through that of the 45 cases reviewed by the third party, Greg's wasn't one of them. Right. Which I don't know how that's possible considering the whole review was brought about because of Greg. <laughs> because of this case, yeah. And, it, you know, it was just a joke. It, it was it was a go through the motions. Let's just appease people. Let's hope they're stupid enough to, to think we actually did something here and let's move on. And, this and that's what of, it was. This is one of those moments too, Mike, where I'm like, am I the one that's that's buying into like a conspiracy theory? You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of how it feels. Like, I'm the guy on the conspiracy theory side while everybody else has this calm thinking and everybody you know, what you see is, is the truth, right? And that's what, that's what the council, the police department, like everybody is leading you on that way. And, and you're over here in the corner saying, well, everybody that in lead, these leadership positions right now are pretty confident Greg's guilty. And also that the police are doing a good job. So what exactly am I missing? Like, are, are, is this just a really good job of producing this documentary? Or is this like, are these guys that corrupt that Everybody knows they're in on it, but they still go about their business. Yeah, you got to remember, the city council, presumably, or the city of Cedar Park, are the ones who paid this third party to do this review, right? Yeah. So they paid them to do the review. And who has the most to lose if that review comes back and is scorching? It's it's the town, right? It could yeah, be the, the mayor who they showed in this episode. It could be the town manager. It could be Mannix. So the, the very people paying for the review are the very people who stand to lose the most should the review be negative. Yeah. To me, that's not a good way to do a review. Right. You know, I think Sean Dick seems to be pr going about this in a pretty fair way. The Williamson County District Attorney, but you got to remember, he wasn't involved at the time. So he's looking at it as a true third party, him and the rest of his prosecutors. Um, yeah. And I think that's the only people from a prosecution, police department, city point of view that are looking at this probably the way they should have in an honest way. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know. It just got me thinking, like, what am I missing here that I I'm buying into everything, but Everybody else is, is basically saying, well, you're crazy, right? Everything's fine here. Everything's on the up and up. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the judge, uh, let's go back to the writ hearing, it's kind of staying chronologically in this episode. The writ hearing, the judge rules that due process was not given Greg, right? You said, as you mentioned, that his he was innocent in this process and sends this off to appeal the Court of Appeals, um, which I also thought was very interesting. They make the note and they brought in a former person that was sat on that Court of Appeals that. It's made up primarily, and I don't know exclusively, maybe, but I know at least primarily made up of former prosecutors and their whole, the whole being for that court is to find a way to hold up that original prosecution is what we're told, right? And, and we, we, we know that's the case because 
what they had found three. I guess there's different ways of of different rulings, right? And the the best you can do is complete innocence. And they they've only they've only found that what three times? She only found that three times in seven years working on the board or in this That's court. Correct. That was an eye popping stat, and she was that was a very unique perspective from her. I, I thought she gave a she was a very good uh, person to include in this. And I'm surprised she admitted that, right? I, I almost feel like she might have been a little bitter about the position, or maybe didn't feel like it was doing its. Uh, due diligence or at least serving the public like it was supposed to for her to kind of speak out like that yeah it, it, again you got her she was candid and honest when you know it's not very often you, you get to talk to a one sitting judge and 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 they're that honest you know and this texas texas court of criminal appeals man i mean when you think of law and order in texas this is the kind of court i think of at least you know uh -huh. i mean they're trying to uphold these you know they're trying to uphold these it's flat out she said it like you just said word for word they look at their primary function as trying to hold up convictions as opposed to reversing them. And that's a scary prospect to think that Greg's trying to have something happen that to her recollection happened under five times in seven and a half years. Yes. It's wild, but you know, they, they kind of justify it by saying, and we, we hear this from, I don't know, maybe Mannix too, but look, the first case goes through all the different steps of our legal system, right? So in order to get to that ruling of guilty, you have to overcome all these different elements of the case and get the jury to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that he did whatever he was accused of or, you know, in any case. Now, of course, you know, when you peel it back and you see the investigation, you hear about the jurors, you know, you hear all the pieces to it. It makes you very skeptical of how that final verdict was correct or not. But I guess for the appeals court, I mean, I don't know how deeply they dive into everything in these cases. I'm sure the judge's recommendation from the writ hearing has to carry a little bit of weight though, right? When she comes back and says that there's complete innocence here, I mean, that's got to carry a pretty good amount of weight to where they at least have to do their work to look into the case. Yeah, like you wonder. So like, you know, I think it was uh, Sean Dick who said, or I can't remember who exactly said, or maybe Hampton, Keith Hampton said, they could just completely ignore the ruling, the ruling of the Williamson County Court. But you would have to think that if another judge that's of pretty high stature also took a look at everything and came to this conclusion, like, how could those nine appellate court judges really disagree that much with the with the Williamson County judge? You know, mm -hmm. just from looking at it from that standpoint. But again, who know you know who knows with the way they look at things? I think a lot of how they operate seems to be like almost not secret, but not very well known. You know, from what I got from them, like it's just nine people you don't really have much you know have any interaction with reviewing the case and making a decision. And the way you find out is by refreshing a web page. Right. Yeah. Pretty crazy. And. You know, while we're on the, the hearing, might as well talk about Cody Mitchell, Texas Ranger. All right, Mike, uh, make sense of this for me. We we saw two sides to this Ranger, right? The side that he was in there. He's the guy that comes in, right? The, the beacon of shining light that's looking for the truth, is going to find the truth no matter what. He's in there. He's digging through the case. He's He's talking to Jonathan McCarty. He's doing all the work he needs to do. And then all of a sudden, this whole warrant comes about where he's filing a second warrant, basically brings it to Sean Dick saying, it's not a big deal. I just want to look into a couple things, uh, downplays it to get the signature because he tried to go to the judge first without the DA's appro approval of it. The judge sent him over to take the correct uh, and the proper path in the channels to get to where he needs to. But ultimately, he gets that warrant, finds this information and puts it out there. And again, we find out now that, you know, it didn't make any difference in the writ hearing, which I think tells you a lot, right? Everybody kind of overlooked this information, even though the Ranger tried to make a big deal out of why he thought Greg was still a very legitimate suspect in this case. But everybody else kind of ignored it. But again, Keith Hampton's takeaway was this is a drive-by. He went in to smear Greg Kelly's reputation so that if something does happen, he gets out. You know what? There's still going to be that doubt in everybody's mind whether or not he did this. This is this is the most confusing part of the documentary to me so far, and I hope we get some clarity to this. I hope this is not just like the end of the arc with the with the Texas Ranger. I, I can't believe that it is. He went from basically exonerating Greg on the stand during during the writ hearing, right? Thus, in two, then less than two weeks later, he seems to be building a case against him, and he's trying to sway public opinion against Greg, and no one can figure out why. I mean, Keith Hampton's been around the block plenty; he can't figure it out. Sean Dick can't figure it out. And most of all, obviously, Greg can't figure it out at all. And it's like a, it's like perplexing. It's a complete mystery. The only valid reasoning I can think is, I think the Ranger probably thinks like most of us do at this time. 
a crime happened and he wants to figure out who did it, but he has a very strange way of going about it. Maybe. Um, but it's a year and a half has gone by since he, since he filed for these search warrants and he hasn't even given anyone a complete investigative report on what he <laughs> think happens happened. So that tells me even more, this was just done to smear Greg publicly and make him look bad publicly. Because like you mentioned, the following people had access to that search warrant before Greg was released. The judge, the DA, and Hampton. And it all meant nothing to them. It did not impact, right? It did not impact their the, the judge or the DA and Greg getting out on bond. So what was the other what was the point of releasing it to the public other than to discredit him and why discredit him? Yeah. I keep on coming back to that. I can't think of a single reason why. I don't know either. I don't know either. And and it just makes you think there's something deeper underneath the surface, like a higher power that's kind of pulling these strings. It, it feels that way, right? I mean, on at every level, because you think the Ranger comes in with a pretty neutral position, right? I mean, if, if the Texas Rangers coming in with an agenda from somewhere, it's got to make you feel pretty awful about your, your justice system in Texas, I would think. And you got, and th- remember, Sean Dick is the one who got this guy involved. Yeah. So, he, you know, and you can tell he was getting a little frustrated with the Ranger as well. And the fact that scene with the Ranger being there when Greg got released on bond, <laughs> it, that was like a weird scene, man. Yeah. I mean, that guy, I mean, he was, he was front and center there in his gigantic pickup truck. I think he had his Texas Ranger hat on, like a big, like, like a sort of say to Greg, like, hey, you're, you're out on bond, but. I'm still here investigating you, you know? Yeah, it Just was. A weird move. Keith Hampton thought it was weird, and it was, he was kind of pissed about it. I didn't think, when he answered the question, hey, what, what do you, why are you here? What do you think about this? He said, you know, it's a good, it's a good day. I thought that it seemed like a, an honest answer. So it didn't, his answer didn't rub me the wrong way, like a creepy, like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I was yeah. expecting, but it made me feel not, not as bad. Like, maybe he is here to see this kid get out. You know what I mean? Like, maybe he presented all the information that he had, tried to make the case, did his job right to help the police or you know help the people that prosecuted but now he saw him get out and he wanted to be there to see him get out i don't know i don't know but it yeah was and you know we should probably the main two things in this search warrant that were made public are what are what we we talked about one of them last episode right we talked about him being a member of adult friend finder yeah oh yeah and they went through how yeah, you none of that. the registered email addresses that he had in his search warrant were on file at Adult Friend Finder of as ever being active accounts. That's first of all. The next big thing in that search warrant was a selfie that Greg took with a four-year-old boy who was the, who they, he said in the search warrant was the first accuser. Come to find out the picture that he's referring to is not a picture of Greg and the first accuser. Well, not the that they're boy. aware of. Right. Not that they're aware. So we don't exactly. we don't know if that picture exists, but the only one they could think of was a picture of another boy that wasn't that that victim. Yeah. So, so. it just I meant to say it that way. Sorry about that. That's yeah. good clarification on your part. But it's just and Keith Hampton makes a good point. You know, to so they're saying he he was never a member of Adult Friend Finder that the website like verified that. But Keith Hampton saying even if he was. You know, yeah. it's a little bit of a stretch to go from adult friend finder member to pedophile. Yeah, you've said that before. And yeah. Yeah. And I actually, I, I'm glad to hear Keith Hampton say that because I didn't know if I was missing something. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I, I kind of agree with him on that. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and yeah, and I wonder if like, it, did he just feel the ranger that feel that, hey, I can put this information there and nobody's going to check it. Right. I mean, is that, is that how things to get, get verified around there? Right. Is there any kind of fact checking going on that he felt like he just, if, if, adult friend finders being honest and you know, if their records go all the way back to the beginning and this stuff wasn't just scrubbed off recently or whatever it is, but assuming that adult friend finder is correct and this was never out there, you know, how, how can he have the gall to put that in there and not expect anybody to call him on it? Like, I, I don't know. It's, yeah, exactly. it's, it's all, it's all then, weird. Yeah, it is. All, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty strange situation. And uh, I, I'm, I'm more perplexed by the fact that you drop a search warrant like that, and then you don't even do a full report and submit. I oh, know, right? <laughs> that that's strange to me too. So, so that's uh, the gist of the case stuff. We also get to see Greg uh, how he's spending his time between being released on bond and awaiting the decision of the court of appeals, which again seems like a, sh- a really crappy way to go about things, right? To just have to refresh your your screen every Wednesday at a certain time to see if your case has been decided or not, but. We see he gets engaged, Mike. At least he's living his life a little bit. He gets engaged to Gabri. And again, we've ta- said it here before, but credit her for sticking around for 
this long, right? Four years sticking by him. But she, she talks about that on this, in this episode. And the other big part of this was him just trying to get back into shape, right? Trying to continue to work out. Because as he says, he's still kind of held hostage because he can't, he can't start planning his life yet. He doesn't know whether or not he's headed back into prison. So he can't start putting long-term plans into place and setting goals for himself and doing all that stuff, which, you know, it's just tough and something you don't really think about in this, this aspect of it. But his other big goal is to play football at UT. And I think he's got a chance, man. I mean, I, I and again, I don't know. I mean, we, we, again, we haven't watched the final episode. We don't know what's to come, but he seems to be in great shape. He seems to have the drive and the will to get it done. And as long as he can get in and get, to, get exonerated first and get into school, I mean, it'd be a hell of a story to see that happen. Yeah. And the person training him, he's, he went to a, like a, um, uh, like a professional training center, a place that trains professional and aspiring professional athletes. The guy who's training him, I mean, says that from a, from a football standpoint, if he gets to the point where he can try out for the team, he'll make it. It's just a matter of clearing all those hurdles, like you said, mm -hmm. in advance of that. And first and foremost, obviously, is getting exonerated. But, hey, look, I'm not a football scout, but he looked pretty good on the football field. Yeah, quick, strong. Um, yeah, a guy like, he hasn't played football in four years. Right. Granted, I don't know what I don't. I sort of know what I'm looking at, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I was more surprised at that. That it didn't really look like there was much of a difference between him and guys who uh, uh, presumably were either in the middle of their college careers or played college football. And by the time this episode, and I don't know what what how the time frame. We don't have a great idea of the time frame. We we had a couple markers, you know, throughout this episode, but. He gained, he's gained a ton of weight and 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 really bulked oh, yeah. up between when he got out and, and between you know him working out in this facility in Austin. I mean, some serious work was put in during that time, so we know it's been significant. But so, Mike, this episode wraps up right with Keep Ham Hampton still talking about the possibility that everything gets swept away from Greg. It's still got to get to the Court of Appeals. They still have to do their part of this to exonerate him so that he can remain out of prison. And Keith Hampton still seems skeptical. Okay. The last scene of this, and they've done a really good job in this series of kind of setting you up with the last scene, but the last scene of this episode is Patricia Cummings. And it, uh, just a, another look at her taking the stand again. So obviously the final episode is going to be the big reveal. What's, what, what's the determination? What was the future hold for Greg? But what does Patricia Cummings have to do with this finale, Mike? It, look, I, my mind first went somewhere really dark, like she's going to drop a bombshell against Greg. But then the more I got thinking of it, what if she drops a bombshell on Jonathan McCarty? You know what I mean? Right. I, I don't know. Like it could, obviously, based on how she handled herself early on, earlier on in this documentary, I lean towards her trying to hatchet job Greg even more than she tried <laughs> to do before. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you never know how these documentaries work. She, that could just be in there to, to throw us for a loop, you know? It could. But I, I would figure she's going to play pretty prominent in this last episode. And I don't know. Like, this is one of those true crime documentaries where I really have no clue what's going to happen. A yeah. lot of times by now in these documentaries, you can sort of figure stuff out. Well, she... um she can't, I mean, she can't do anything else to sway the case at this point, right? I mean, from what we know, unless we go back and learn something else that we, you know, had already happened prior to Court of Appeals, at this point, she can't really sway anything, correct? I yeah, mean, you're right. You're right. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, it is what it is. The Court of Appeals has all the information that, right. th that they need, yeah. So, yeah. Your, you know, your point of, of McCarty is interesting, too, because I think, you know, w the thing I failed to mention during that time frame of him waiting things out was that Jonathan McCarty got arrested for rape of an underage girl, too. Yeah, and the girl came forward after she saw after she she saw that he was being investigated in the Greg Kelly case, right. and I guess he had done a, a string of rapes in different counties, and the one that he got charged for was was the one that occurred in in uh, Williamson County. So yeah. all host of these girls came forward. I think it was a fifteen year old girl that came forward and had a pretty graphic story about what Jonathan McCarty um, did to her. Yeah, well, my my gut on on Cummings is that. Something's something's off there. I told you that from the beginning. So I, I would assume that she does something that goes against uh, Greg in this. So what do you what's your what's your ultimate gut here telling you, Mike? Going to the finale, is he going to get out of prison for good, or is he heading back to jail? My gut is that he gets out. Okay, my gut. You've been you've been a before. I'll preface this. You've been a gumshoe <laughs> right from the first word of this documentary. You've been on this. A lot. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm trusting you haven't lucky. Googled anything. I'm trusting you haven't Googled anything in advance. No, no, I haven't. I know. I, I know. I haven't I, touched I'm anything. And so my gut tells me that 
he's 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 going to be found. He's going to be found. The charges will be upheld, essentially. Ooh, I, so I on opposite sides. Well, because I, the only reason I say that is because just everything's been working against him, and, and we've seen Greg point that out. We've seen Keith Hampton point that out, and I know listening to a victim, you know, a, a person accused and and prosecuted, you don't you, you take their word with a grain of salt. But seeing Hampton kind of be befuddled by some of the things that have happened in this case, to see Mannix defend this the operation here and kind of turn a blind eye to to what was really awful work along the way. The you know, the original defense lawyer, Patricia Cummings, her not doing her job at all. Like literally, I don't know what she did in the case, to be honest with you. Like not uh, just just start with the date. Where was he on the date of the uh, alleged offense? To start there. But so everything adds that up. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I just feel like everything in this in this episode here was to kind of tell you how many people feel like Greg's innocent, right? The jury, Keith Hampton, the judge of the red hearing, Greg, you know, all these people outside of the original case and then these, this court of appeals that is made up of prosecutors that had the same thinking as the original DAs that prosecuted it makes me feel like we're setting it up to be, despite all that, here we are, he's heading back to prison. That's just yeah. that's the way I see it. And, you know, I'm usually the kind of guy in these true crime documentaries that I, it's usually very hard to sway me that someone who was found guilty is innocent, right? So, like, True. I still think, for instance, Stephen Avery's guilty. I still think, for instance, that the kid in the serial podcast is guilty. Okay. Right? But here. Just to give you an idea. So I'm not easy to sway. The only thing that makes gives me pause is how nervous Keith Hampton is. Right. And I don't know if he's just like that because he's got to, you know, prepare for all scenarios but that's the only thing that gives me pause for concern is his experience level and how nervous he still is and i, and I don't know if it's a good thing that the court of appeals has taken so long we don't know exactly how long it's been right I, I i guess a year and a half because as you mentioned earlier on hampton said it's been a year and a half and we haven't gotten anything from the ranger yet so i'm assuming that, that interview has taken place before the appeal has come down good point good point now it might it might not have we, we might not you know it could be something after yeah. the fact and they just pieced it out and put it in there right but i how i just don't know how it's taking that long to come up with the decisions i don't know if that's good or bad either so anyway mike we're gonna wrap it up on that note and uh i'm probably gonna watch episode five tonight uh, after we record this but this will come out we'll release this one we're gonna have episode five uh released the day after you said it's gonna air live on showtime right yeah it's gonna air live on showtime uh this upcoming Sunday, August second. Okay, so uh, we'll have we'll have this episode out August third. We got to record it a little ahead of time. But again, we haven't watched it. We don't know it's going to come. Hopefully, you're following this along episode by episode. But if not, you know what happens probably, and you can judge our opinions on that either way. But we'll be back and we'll wrap this thing all up. But it's been a, it's been an interesting journey, a fun journey along the way. But make sure you hit subscribe on whatever podcasting app you listen to. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find the, you can find the podcast there. Every episode's there as well. DistantReplayPodcast.com is our website. And then also Twitter and Instagram. You can find us both there. So, Mike, we'll close it out, man. We talked about more than I thought we would for this episode, but I'm geared up ready for episode five. I don't know what's going to happen. One of us will be right, though. That I can say. One of us will be right. And uh, until then, we'll catch you guys later. Bye.